You know, this is a, a very special moment for those of you who may not know uh, Vanessa Tapia. She has been attending Mosaic um, for many years now and has now decided to reconsecrate her life once again to Jesus this morning. And so, amen. I tell you, there is nothing more special than to declare his faithfulness, you know, unto the Lord. And that's what she decided to do. In fact, we have a, a hymn that's going to uh, uh, express those sentiments. And so I want to go ahead and uh, encourage uh, that right now as we uh, prepare uh, for this baptism. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, because of God's faithfulness and your desire to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it's my privilege uh, to officiate this special moment right now. And so I, I want to ask, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. All right. I want to make sure it's a good hearty affirmation on that. All right. And do you understand, you know, the basic Bible teachings as taught by and affirmed by the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And it is, it, is it your desire to live in harmony with them? Yes. All right. And is it now your desire to be baptized by immersion as a public expression of your faith and to allow Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to make you a new person? Yes. All right, amen. Because of that faithfulness and your desire that you have declared, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and also in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Take your seats. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to speak to those who have been thinking about getting baptized. Is there someone here this morning that wants to say, Lord, I've been thinking about that. The Holy Spirit has been convicting my heart to make this decision. If, if that's your desire, I want to invite you to stand where you are right now. Stand to your feet and say, Lord, I want to consider this in the future. I want to I want to pray. I, yeah, praise God. Yes, praise God. Amen. Amen. I want to pray for you guys. But I'm also asking for those that have been thinking about reconsecrating their life to Jesus. Remain standing. I'm going to I'm going to pray for you guys. Let's, let's stay standing for a moment because it's a public testament, a testimony that when you stand up for Jesus, Jesus is saying, "I'm standing up for you." And so if if there's someone here this morning that would like to say, "Lord, I would like to recommit my life. I don't want you to think that because you think that 
rebaptism or reconsecration is kind of you know connected with something that I've done in my life and somehow I've you know distanced myself from Jesus I don't want you to think like that I want you to think of it as a a moment where you are now reaffirming what you have believed in many years and want to deepen that relationship with Jesus by by publicly expressing once again if that's your desire to say Lord I want to do this not right now but I want to do this I want to ask you to stand Amen. Amen. I'm gonna, let's go ahead and pray. I want to pray for everyone, especially for those who, who stood earlier. Join with me. Join with me as we pray. Father, I want to thank you for what you've done in Vanessa's life. I'm asking, Father, and the same thing in the lives of those that have stood right now, publicly declaring that because of Jesus stood up for them, they're standing up for Jesus. And so, Lord, there's no greater moment right now in our life than this moment because scripture says that that there is great rejoicing in heaven when a person stands up to accept and to declare publicly Jesus in their life and so we're right now joining with the angels joining together rejoicing because of what's happening right now and so father I'm asking that you be with those individuals that stood to their feet that you will that you will continue to support this decision until they will make this a reality. But I'm also asking that for you to, to rebuke the enemy who will invariably try his very best to dissuade them from the decision that they have just made. Lord, rebuke the devil and cast them away and don't allow him to cause, them, cause him to redirect this decision that they have made. So bless them, Father, now as we continue to worship you and allow the angels to surround them in their journey and protect them until once again we find ourselves here in this baptistry fulfilling the decision that they have made as we ask it in the name of your Son. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. I'd like to invite the children up for our children's story. And the first thing we're going to do is give them little blue buckets where they will go around and collect the children's ministry offering. So children, come on up to the front where this little church is. And then once the children come back, I'm going to have them do something else. As a reminder, this um, big like measurement board is for our new sanctuary. And look, there is a new number up there. We went from 90,000 now to 100,000. So this is great progress. Yes. And we like to have the children do this as kind of a... Um, a, a visual to who this church is for. It's for us, but it's also for the future for our children. Um, there's some money over there. You guys want to go get some money? Good job. Yes, exactly. Here you go. Yes, perfect. Thank you, everyone. 
put the money in the little church. Okay, so how is your summer going? You guys are having a good summer? Yes? Okay. Okay, we're almost done. Did you guys um, do anything this summer, like eat like a lot of treats more than usual? More snacks? Okay. Um, do you guys like marshmallows? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So um, I want you to imagine something with me for a second. Imagine you are sitting at your uh, kitchen table, and it's just you, and your mom puts in front of you on the kitchen table a single marshmallow. And she says to you, you are allowed to eat it, and I'm going to leave the room for five minutes. If I come back and the marshmallow is still on the table, you'll get a reward. And so she leaves the room, and she told you kind of the rules of this game. You're allowed to eat the marshmallow. So if you wanted to, you could eat it. But she also told you, if the marshmallow is still there, you get a reward. This is something called the marshmallow test. And it's a test about self-control. Now, you guys know what self-control is, right? OK, self-control is when you have a temptation. Something is in front of you that you want. And self-control is knowing that what you want might not be good for you, might not be something you need right away. And so this marshmallow test uh, was done actually as a study to see if kids have self-control. So on the next slide, the kids were um, having a choice to make, right? You have a choice. You can eat the marshmallow now, and you can get that instant gratification, that sweet, yummy taste of a marshmallow, right? Or you can wait five minutes and see what kind of reward you get if you don't eat the marshmallow. Now, you have no idea what the reward is. It might be another marshmallow, okay? It might be something even better than a marshmallow, or the reward might have been nothing, but you don't know. You have a choice. You can either have something now that you know is really, really yummy and good, or you can wait and see what comes later. And so um, God tells us that in our lives, we have a lot of temptations. There are a lot of things that we really want that might not be good for us or might not be something that we should have right away. Um, what's the next slide? Let's see. Okay, there are other temptations in our lives that we know are wrong. And sometimes what we want might be so strong, you know, that we are tempted to do it, such as cheating on a test, right? There are other things that we could be tempted to do, uh, such as take, maybe take somebody's toy away and not tell them. Um, I don't know, I'm sure you guys can think of other things that are tempting to you every single day. But did you know God says, in the next slide, God says that there is no temptation that can overtake you. That's not common to man. In other words, there's no temptation in the world that somebody else hasn't been through. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your strength. And he will give you a way of escape that you can endure it. So whenever you face something that you are tempted to choose to um, choose the marshmallow, let's say. God will always give you a way out. Um, thank you. Uh, who would like to pray? Anyone want to volunteer to pray? Do you want to, Maya? Okay. Okay. Everyone close your eyes and bow your heads. Dear Jesus, we pray for this day. We pray for everybody who made it here, and we pray for those people who didn't make it here. We'll, we'll make it here next time. And we pray for everybody else that are safe. We pray that no harm or danger will come upon us. And we pray for 
for our parents, our friends, and everyone in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, bye everyone. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, so our focus of prayer this morning is for the Lowe family, as we know them, Pastor Eric, Esther, and little Lauren. Um, but before we pray for them, I invite you to sing with the worship. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for one more Sabbath that you have given us. Thank you because we have the freedom to come to your church and worship, Lord, have fellowship with others. And just thank you for all the blessings that you give us daily, countless blessings, Lord. I want to pray especially for the Lowe family. Um, I want you to please guide them in whatever plans you have for them to always have them have that feeling that you are with them because you are Lord. I want to ask you also for little Lauren. She's very loved in this church with all her laughs that she's always running around with. I want to ask you please to please bless her that she not only grows in just wisdom and stature, but also in your favor, Lord. Please be with every one of us today and always. In Jesus' name, amen.
Uh, hello, uh, as most of you know, my name is Jonathan, and I'm going to do the expression of gratitude and call to offering today. But first, I have a small verse from Psalms 9, verse 1. I will praise the, thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. As some of you know, two years ago, my family and I were in a motor vehicle accident where I fractured both of my legs. But God was watching over me, and he made sure that my growth plates were untouched. So I'm still able to walk and uh, grow today. Mm -hmm. He also left my, uh, my family alone and left all of them unharmed, which I am grateful for. Some ways to express our gratitude and gratefulness is through offerings. There are three ways to give. One is through the drop box outside next to the front door. The other is through the baskets at the back of the sanctuary. And another way is to give online at adventistgiving.org. Uh, now may the deacons come forward, please. Uh, let us all bow our heads for prayer. Uh, our Father, uh, who is in heaven, uh, thank you for allowing us to come here and worship today on this wonderful Sabbath morning. Uh, please uh, bless the pastor and give him the ability to speak uh, what you want us to hear. Uh, help us to listen to your message and help us to enjoy today and rest. We love you, Lord. Amen. Good morning. We want to talk about our evangelism series that's coming up in, looks like November, right? So this is in November 4th is when it starts. It's going to be 24 sessions, so it's going to go run until November 27th. But don't worry, it's, it's not going to be during Thanksgiving, so, so we'll have family time too. Pastor Byron Corbett, you may know him. He used to be at the Richardson Church. He's the conference evangelist now for the Texas Conference. He will be leading this series in preaching. What I would like to do right now is to get everyone to reach in your bulletins uh, and pull out this form that says, Ways You Can Help for Our Reaping Series. So pull them out and hold them up <laughs> so I can see them. What, what we would like to do, so this is... Partly like an offering, right? But there's no money involved, but it's time and, and your prayers are what we really need. And, and the first box um, on here is, I will pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on the people of our city, the reaping series, and our church. And if you, can, if you think you can do that um, for the church and for these people, please check that, that box. Uh, the next one is, I will attend as many meetings as possible. Having church members at the meetings encourages others, and it's very beneficial. Plus, it, it helps with, there's always little errands that need to be run and things, and, and people can help with that. So if you're able to attend as many meetings as possible, please check that box. And the third box is what you can volunteer to do, because we need greeters, and we need ushers, row hosts. We have a children's program. Um, Alicia leads that, and she could definitely use your help with that. There's, along with that, there's materials that she would need for crafts and things. Transportation, somebody needs a ride to the series, um, that kind of thing. And then refreshments afterwards. And so if you're able to help with any of these things, please please check those out. So. What, what we're trying to do, I know it's three months away, but we really want to get a team together now, and the sooner the better. And if we find out who's interested and, and able to help, that's, that's what we want to do. But we want everyone involved in, in this. And the last one is I will pray for God to lead me to five people who are searching that can bring, we can bring to the meetings. They're successful when you bring friends and family, coworkers. Those are the those are the most um, successful ways to, to make this series a success. 
and then at the bottom, please sign with your name and contact information. Thank you very much for, for your support in this. Um, the, the big glass table, the big round table out there, you can put, there's a box you can put these in. So please put them in there so we can get a good understanding of, of who's able to help. Thank you very much. Mike, I need to adjust this, brother. I'm not like, you know, Goliath, man. All right. You know that Bible verse that says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, right? Amen. And let me tell you, there's nothing more praiseworthy than what my brother Mike just shared. Because remember, the psalmist says that I was glad when they told me, come, let us go to where? To the house of the Lord. So this is like asking you, hey, go to someone and tell them, hey, you're going to be glad when you tell that person, come to the evangelistic series of meetings that we're going to be hosting and having. I'll tell you, let me tell you, it is nothing that, that you have ever seen before. These are a brand new set of meetings, series that you guys are going to enjoy. Well, we're going to go ahead and have a moment of prayer, prayer consecration with Sister, where is she, Vanessa? She's here. Okay, yeah, why don't you come up? We're going to have a prayer consecration, and then... We're going to have a moment, a housekeeping item. Yeah, we got to put our hands together because let me tell you, a, there is a party, a gathering in heaven that is happening right now because of the decision she has made. You know, and this decision is not limited by age. And I want to encourage those who, who made those decisions as well as those who continue to make these decisions. Vanessa, I have a, um, I have a gift here. On behalf of the church that I want to give you, it's in the bag. You know, it's, uh, it's something that you're going to enjoy that's going to help you in your walk with Christ. But before you can put your hands on it, we're going to have a special prayer. And the, the baptismal certificate is also in there as well. Okay? So we're going to have a prayer, and then we'll take care of a housekeeping item when we're going to bring her into our body of fellowship together by way of a vote. But before we do that, we're going to have prayer. Let's pray. Father, it is with excitement and great joy, just the same joy that we're talking about in the book of James, where it says, count everything joy, and this is obviously one of them. Lord, we're asking now for a special outpouring. We want the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please, we're asking in a very special way. You've been in our midst this morning. You have manifested yourself daily in Sister Vanessa's life, and we're asking now, Lord, that you will continue to do this continually from this day forth. In fact, right now, I'm asking that you will descend upon her, Lord, as a symbol of the water that cleansed her from, her, from sin and the promise of Jesus to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that symbolically, Lord, not because there's anything uh, tangible with us laying hands upon them or anything magical, but rather because as a symbol, as, we, as I place my hand upon her, that you will inundate her, Father, with the presence of the third person of the Godhead. Holy Spirit, please deposit upon her not only the gift that you, through Scripture, say that we receive, that you impart, that you give to all your believers, a variety of different gifts, but that you'll also give her a continuous, uh, uh, the, 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 not just the, the gift of the Spirit, but also the fruit of the Spirit that the fruit of the Spirit will be manifested in her life every single day, that she will know that this is not the end, but rather this abiding beginning of having Jesus every single day in her life. And so anoint her right now, Lord Jesus, that you will make yourself known in her life every single day. So bless her to this end, Father, as you now anoint her. And now, Lord, I pray that you will continue to allow her to be part of our church family every single day, that she will continue to be part of this family and continue to use the gifts in the context of what we're trying to do, which is bring others into the kingdom of your, into the kingdom in the awareness of your son Jesus. So bless us, Father, to this end, and bless Sister Vanessa from this day forward as we have been asking from this moment. Thank you, as we ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Okay, Sister Vanessa, here you are. I'm going to give this to you. Yes, yes, hold on a second. All right, now, just a quick moment of housekeeping. Is, is, we need a quick motion to bring her into fellowship. Is there a motion and a second? All right, wonderful. We got a second. All in favor, say aye. aye. And any opposed? All right, wonderful. Usually we don't get any uh, opposition. That's a good thing. Amen. All right, thank you so much, Sister. Welcome to the family. Happy Sabbath, church. Today's scripture reading comes from James chapter 1, verses 13, and it reads, Let no one say he is tempted. I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. Neither nor does he, does he tempt anyone, but he himself tempts anyone. Let me read again. Let anyone, let no one say when he is tempted. I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, evil nor does he himself be tempts anyone. May the Lord bless the scripture reading. Well, good morning once again, or just this good afternoon now. Uh, it's a blessing being here. I know this is not my last Sabbath here. Uh, I'm not leaving until September 17th, so I'll be up here a few more times probably. Uh, my wife, however, next week will be her last Sabbath here. Uh, she'll come down on the 17th briefly again. Um, so if you want to see Lauren, grab her before they disappear today. Um, as we begin today, uh, I just want to say, you know, how thankful I am. It has been such a privilege and blessing being here. And I've just had a wonderful time being a part of this family of believers. Uh, as we look at this message today, um, I was asking myself the question, you know, as we look at James, what, what is it really all about? Did you know that when, when Luther, Martin Luther, he, he read James, he didn't like it very much. He considered it an epistle of straw, which some people have assumed meant that he wanted to throw it out completely. But in actuality, he just regarded it as part of perhaps a cluster of books, including uh, Jude, Hebrews, and Revelation, that just didn't seem to be as gospel-centric. And, you know, many times in, in this church, we, we study and we read about the Gospels, and even we find Jesus in the Old Testament. And then you read the book of James, and you're like, well, where did Jesus go, right? I mean, even Hebrews refers to Jesus. Revelation refers to Jesus. Jude, but, but where's Jesus in, in James? Well, today, as, as we look at this, I, I want to recognized, yes, it's true that, that Martin Luther felt it was an epistle straw. Yes, he felt it was maybe a lesser book compared to the rest. But indeed, we can find the gospel in James. And more than that, I think, you know, many of these other books, they, they focus on our initial experience meeting Christ and having a relationship with Him. And then James focuses on, okay, now that you know Jesus, where are you going to go with Him? And so I, I think it brings together a beautiful picture a holistic picture of where we can go in the Christian walk. So join me once more as we pray this morning and begin. Father in heaven, Lord, here we are. We're about to embark on a Bible study once more, and we pray that your spirit would be here. Lord, we can try to, to study and read the words and have them go in one ear and out the other, or we can just seek you, realizing that you can make it all make sense. And so, Lord, we pray that you would take the words of my mouth and the scheming and writing and trying to figure out what to say today and, and help it to come out in a way that really hits home, in a way that can make a difference for eternity. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So far in the series, we've looked at a few things. Pastor Frank has introduced us to the book and gotten us started. We've, we've learned really two major things. Number one, uh, we need to ask for wisdom because God is ready and willing to give it. And number two, we need to persevere, right? We, we've looked at these two themes. And today I want to continue on um, in James chapter 1, but from verse 13 onwards. Uh, and, and thank you so much to... Um, the scripture reading this morning, because that really introduced us to the beginning point for our passage today. And so if you'll pick up your Bibles, we're going to be looking at James chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 13. The Bible tells us that no one say when he is tempted, 
I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts everyone. Is that what it says? No, 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 no. It says he tempts no one. You know, as we look at this, this question, we have to ask the, ask the question, do we have more capability than God? Do we have more capability? I mean, God, we can be tempted, right? God cannot be tempted. Do we have more capability? No. No, because God in His wisdom, He sees the end from the beginning, and, and something comes along and says, oh, you should do this, right? And He's like, oh, no, I, I know what that'll turn out. It'll be a terrible idea. Why would I do that? But we, in our short-sightedness, we're like, ooh, fun. You know, let, let me eat that extra piece of cake, and, and we keep doing that, right? And, and 10 years down the line, we have a heart attack and die, right? There's different kinds of temptation from God. But I want to ask the question, is there a God we have to worship? What would you say would be the third temptation that we have to worship? What would you think the third temptation is? It says, if this is all you have, what is the root cause of temptation here? I heard it somewhere, evil, right? Now, is there such thing as a, a good temptation? There are needs in life, right? You're walking in the desert, you're thirsty, and you, are, you have a desire to drink water. Is that e No, that's not evil. And yet, in this context, temptation, of course, usually has a negative connotation. So over here we see God cannot be tempted by evil, but implication is we can. And so this is what we're going to look at for the remainder of this message. So what... Must we be tempted with or by many times evil? We read on. Where does evil come from? Now, I can't tell you like where evil comes from comes from, but I can tell you where the text says it initially comes from, and we'll work our way from there. The Bible tells us, we pick it up in verse uh, 14, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his what? His own desire. Guess what, guys? I have bad news for you. If the devil died tomorrow... The world would not be a much better place because we have temptation. We have evil within our own hearts. We would not just stop desiring bad things. Uh, sometimes when we grow up, we think of, you know, this idea of there's an angel on one shoulder and the devil's on the other, right? And you walk along through life and, and you see something and you're tempted, right? Uh, that's not quite how it works. Temptation builds itself into us because we have evil, sinful hearts. It's something we've been given. The world has been infected. There's a pandemic behind all pandemics. And it's a pandemic of sin and a pervasiveness of evil. And unfortunately, we cannot escape it on our own. And so then we have to ask the question, verse 15. It says, but when desire, uh, but then desire, when it has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth what? Death. Death. Bad news, Right? It starts bad, it gets worse. So death comes as a result. So we need to pause here and ask ourselves the question, what are we lured and enticed by? Our desires. Now, wait a minute, Pastor Eric. Are you saying that my desires are bad? No. No, we have good desires, right? And we have bad desires, right? We love our families, good or bad? Good. We, we, we desire lunch after the service today. Sorry, there's no potluck, Right? <laughs> We, we, these are good desires, right? So how do we tell the difference between good desires and bad ones? Well, I would propose today that there's two ways we can tell the difference, that we can measure and tell the difference in our desires. Number one, the object of our desire. When we look at what we desire, do we need and want it, and is it really good for us? And number two, the extent of the desire. Do we want it so much that we're willing to step on someone else to get it? That, that we're willing to take it when perhaps we shouldn't? These are the ways that we can evaluate. Is desire good? Is it bad? Of course, we have God's Word, right? And that's the foundation as well. We, can, we, we would study Scripture. We say, you know, is this something that God wants me to do? Absolutely. This is a great starting point. But here's the thing. We get to the very next verse, and James gives us a warning. He says, do not be what? Deceived. My beloved brothers. So what is he talking about? He's saying, look, you have desires, and guess what? If you leave it long enough, if you think about it long enough, something that was formerly bad, that was an evil desire, you will begin to think what? Well, maybe it's not so bad after all, right? 
this ever happened? I mean, this happens most often with expensive purchases, right? At first, you're like, oh, that's way too expensive. But man, it would be really nice to have, right? And you start thinking about it, and I'm not saying this is an evil desire, but you're thinking about it, and you start saying, well, you know, what can I tweak? What can I change? How can I make this happen? And before you know it, you walk out with, you know, whatever it is that's been eating away at your pocket, right? It's the same way with, with sinful desires, right? We, we compromise, we begin to evaluate, and the more we stare at the object of our desire, the more susceptible we are to falling for it. This is just how life is. And so James warns us, he says, look, do not be deceived. Don't, don't mess yourself up. Don't kid yourself. You can deceive yourself. You see, the more that we think something is good for us, the more we convince ourselves that it really is. But there's a, there's a better way. The Bible tells us in the following text what we can do. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? Above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I love the second text here. Um, It says, of his own will, he brought us forth. By the word of truth, God speaks truth and he brings real creation forth. Stuff happens, right? I mean, this is the liability. If God said something was bad, that, that he, if he tried to speak something that was evil or bad, it would actually happen. And we have to watch out because he knows you from the beginning. He won't do that. But we don't always know better. And so we look in life and we go along and we can get ourselves messed up. But the the text here says, of his own will, he brought us forth by his word. So there is something inherently powerful in God's words that isn't the same in our words, is there? We say things and we can hurt someone real bad. We, We can make a nasty comment that goes along with someone throughout their entire lives. And it creates within them pain. God, he says things and he actually creates objects and worlds and universes. I love the, the pictures from uh, the James Webb telescope or whatever the last few weeks. I mean, those are just incredible to see and imagine that there's so much out there. And God speaks these things into existence. He's got power. He's got power. He's got unlimited resources. And we, we can create too. But it's a lot more dangerous when we speak Well, let's go back to the text. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. This is what you call a contrast. What he's just been talking about is all the the things that we can come to by our desire. We can deceive ourselves, but God, a little different. He's the one with the good gifts. God gives the good life. You see, we often think financial success, relationships, and, and the things that we want in life are the answer. But what if they're not? What if it's not so much about what we want, but of what God has given us? And perhaps we can learn a lesson here. You see, if you're grasping for things that you desire, and maybe they're even good things, but God has never not given them yet, maybe it's not good for you yet, right? I mean, I look back at my own life and I think to myself, you know, there's, there's a time where if I had jumped ahead of God, I would have not have been ready. And I would probably have messed things up, Right? I mean, I could have gotten married years sooner. I could have found someone along the way that I was not compatible with, right? And who knows the wreck that could have made of my life. I could have gone along and I could have said, you know, I, I want to buy a car right when I was entering college. And I could have been indebted to that, paying car payments the whole time and ending up having to drop out of college or something. I mean, the decisions we make today make a difference for our future. So we need to know that God is with us and that He's leading us because if we jump ahead of Him, It's not that he can't work with us. God works with us in a remedial way, but we can make it harder for ourselves. So the lesson is if you're grasping for things you desire that God has not yet given you, maybe it's not good for you yet. So what's the solution? We pick up the text, verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So let's break this down. Receive the implanted word meekly. How does a person receive a gift? How does a meek, humble person receive a gift? 
oh, hey, you know, thank you so much for that gift. I mean, I know I deserved it. I earned it. And, you know, it's really, I don't know what took you so long to give it to me, but thank you, right? Is that how a meek person receives a gift? No, I mean, you'd want to take it back, wouldn't you? That's not how a meek person receives a gift. In fact, instead, what we find is when you give a humble person a gift, what do they say? Oh, thank you so much. You really shouldn't have. They don't make a big scene out of it, do they? They're humble. They take it. They, they appreciate it, and, and they move on, right? The text says, as we read it, receive with meekness the implanted word. Now, what is an implanted word? We know what uh, implants are usually, like imagine a brain implant, right? Or a heart implant or transplant, right? You implanting, transplanting is the idea of putting something in that wasn't there before or replacing something that was there with something new that will help in some kind of way. And so in the text, we, we see, receive with meekness the implanted word. Receive an implant. What is it? How do you receive a word implant? I mean, must you just open your mouth really wide and be like, ah, no, right? There's something more. We read it. We study it. We, we let it come into our lives, and something begins to happen. Because when you and I look at this book, we might see a little bit of red, white, and black. But in this book is power. You see, these are the words of God. And when you take God's promises to the bank and you say, God, I'm going to start praying that you will lead. Stuff begins to happen. Stuff begins to happen. You know, at every point in my life when I've prayed, and I've prayed consistently that God would lead, He tends to disrupt things. And to be, to be totally honest, even the place I find myself in now with a, a move coming up, that's God disrupting things because I prayed and I said, Lord, show me where, what you want me to do and where you want me to go. And I, I've always prayed this type of prayer, but we pray this more intentionally uh, towards the end of last year. Lord, what do you want us to do? Is there a new, a new thing we need to try at Mosaic? Is there something else you need? We didn't know. We just sensed that the status quo wasn't quite right. And so we prayed and we said, God, what do you want us to do? And everything gets upset, right? And everything gets turned upside down. That's, that's how God works sometimes. You pray in faith and He does something. His Word is powerful. So we've talked about receiving the implanting, the, the implanted word. And the longer you do that, the more stuff begins to change. What if you don't, though? What happens if you don't receive God's word? Well, James has an answer for that, too. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, verse 22, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intensely at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he was like. Close your eyes for just a moment. Close your eyes with me for just a moment and, and picture in your mind your face in the mirror. Can you picture your face? Uh, maybe picture your closest loved one, a family member. Can you picture their face? Can you hear their voice in your mind? You can open your eyes. Can you see that? Now, some of us may not be visual people, but you might be auditory and you, you hear in your mind things better than you see it. But the point remains that we can usually begin to picture begin to imagine and recall what we know well, right? And this text basically says, look, what you spend time looking at, if you let it, it will change you. You will remember it. It will stick with you. Don't be like an Alzheimer's patient where you think that you're living in a reality, but you're actually living decades ago. And everything new is just it gets forgotten instantly. That's not the place we want to be. The text tells us, look, if you just listen to the Word and you move on with your life, and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm just so excited about what God says. And you're like, oh, well, you know, moving on. This is my life. If you do that, you're like an Alzheimer's patient. You'll forget who you were before you know it. And things will not just match up as they should. Don't claim one reality while living in another. But maybe another problem is that we need to stop looking at ourselves, isn't it? As we've already learned, our desires are evil right? They're deceitful. So where should we look? Well, this is where people begin to get uncomfortable with James. This is where people say, oh, you know, James, he's an epistle of straw. He's a legalist. Uh, verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, 
being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. This is a challenging text for us. How many of you just love reading up on law? I mean, no one cares about law, right? I mean, we care about the existence of law because it's important, but no one really cares about policies, rules, laws. Ah, I mean, come on. But we learn three things about the law here of God. Number one, it's perfect, right? Number two, it results in what? What happens when you, when you keep it? It results in liberty. It says it's the law of liberty. And number three, you will be blessed if you do it. We see we don't like the law. Oh, you know, now I can't do this. Now I can't do that. You know, when, when seatbelts were first introduced, people did not receive it well. They didn't like the idea that you had to be strapped down in your vehicle. I mean, surely it would be better to, to have some flexibility. You know, you, if you're restricted and you're in an accident, whiplash, right? All these things happen. And, and instead, people began to complain about it. And yet, we have all the data today that shows us that, look, if you're in an accident with a seatbelt, more often than not, it's good for you. Because you don't want to go flying out the windshield way down the road and end up with a broken neck. And as we see over time, this law, yes, you might get a ticket for breaking it, but you might save your life by keeping it. And so law has a a dualistic function. Yes, it restricts. Yes, it prevents. Yes, it, it limits. But it does so so that it can bless you, so that it can change your life, so that it can keep you where you need to be. This is the function of law, and yet we don't like it. I mean, now you might say, Pastor Eric, look, I get it, I get it. Don't murder. That's a given, right? I mean, this is obvious. Uh, Don't commit adultery. Okay, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Don't steal my stuff. Yes, please don't steal my stuff. We we understand the laws. I mean, we even understand no false witnesses, right? I mean, who wants to be testified against falsely in court? We, We don't want these things to happen. But what about when it comes to Commandments 4 and 10? You know, we were chatting about this last week in our Sabbath school with the Young Adult Sabbath School. What about Commandments 4 and 10? Many times, you know, we, we think of the Sabbath Commandments, and I don't know about you, but at least as a young person growing up in the church, like there are rules that are placed upon rules. You know, if the water's up to here at the beach, that's okay on the Sabbath. But if it's up to here, that's swimming. There, there's a difference. Uh, if, you know, the food's in the microwave,
Oh, then you could watch. This is a scene of either you couldn't see it, round two, round one. Uh, it's not going to be you just that same day. You have to bring a lot of ways you can be lit like that. You're going to need a lot of things to come to you because it's choice one. Three inches. That's all we're going to say is the three inches. And we're going to take up our lives carefully to be lit with the three inches. What is the potential for us to do? The potential for both of us to take up the light as we think about it. Of course, every wall, crack, or wall that has access is going to come at you in some way. Even the person who feels dread to see their children is in that situation because of the covetousness of others in society. We live in a world where selfishness comes at an expense. But let's, let's not see ourselves as just covetous brothers. So, where's the blessing in keeping the faith? What is the solution to this? Now, you know, being a pastor, I have to say, the solution to this is hug an octopus. You go, wait, what? Plot twist. Come on now. Trust the pastor to bring us all to hug an octopus. So typical, right? Bring in the money into the church. It, it, is that really the solution? Well, no. The solution is very Jesus, isn't it? And even here, I think the solution is Jesus. But let me give you an example of something I experienced with Hag and Octopus that I think will tie this all together with Jesus. You know, as a young person, I don't know about you, uh, but every so often, causes or people would come up or come by, and they'd be like, hey, you know, can you fill my tank with gas? Or whatever the case may be, uh, things would come up. Uh, maybe it's a, a GoFundMe for someone who landed in the hospital. I don't know. And I'd feel convicted, right? And I'd be like, okay, well, what do I have in my wallet? And I'm looking in, and, you know, we love the ones and the fives when we're convicted because that's what we have to give. Uh, but, but woe to the person who opens, and there's the hundred, right? Ah, oh, really? <laughs> you know, it's just we, we're, we're a little selfish. We struggle with these things. Come on, we're, we're real human beings. And so we, and I struggled with this. You know, I remember one time I, I'd helped a guy, and then the very next week, someone else asked for help. And I'm like, look, that was 100 last time, and now it's 40 this time. I'm like, this is all adding up. And I'm looking in my pocket, and I'm just thinking to myself, this, this doesn't go so well. And then I came to the place where I said, you know, I'm just going to commit to God 10 plus 10. Tithe, right, 10%. Offering, I'm going to just match that, because why not? Can't outgive God. I've heard this my whole life. Might as well try it. And so I said, God, 10% tithe, 10% offering on my gross, and, and that's what we'll work with. And you know what began to happen? You know, we, we always talk about how God blesses us when we give, but there's one thing that we never really talk about, a benefit no one, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard someone talk about this benefit. And that is that the next time some, something or someone came up and needed money, it wasn't a problem anymore because I'd already surrendered and committed that to God. And so I looked, and I'm like, oh, I got funds. Hey, sure, happy to help. It wasn't a struggle anymore. I didn't have to look in my wallet and be like, oh, another 20. It changed. Something had changed, and the change was within me because I had surrendered that to God up front. I can't but help imagine that maybe that's just how life is walking with Christ. When we surrender ourselves to Him completely, we don't have to struggle in the same way anymore. You're walking through life and a temptation comes along and you're like, yeah, you know, it's a temptation, right? You have desire. And then you remember, look, I've chosen a better way. My life is new. I'm not saying you'll never struggle again by surrendering to Jesus, but I will tell you that it begins a new path. It starts a new journey where that can begin to change day by day by day. So I want to challenge you today, you know, as you look at this. What would it look like to ask God to give you a new identity so that instead of wrestling with God, you can trust where he's leading? Say to him each day, look, I can't even give you myself, but God, take me anyway. Because sometimes we don't want to give ourselves because we're selfish, right? But we can still ask God to change that part of us so that we are willing. There's always a loophole if we really want it. So why not just ask God and say, look, God, I'm not just going to be a listener like we've read about in this passage, but I want to be a doer. The only problem is I just don't really love, you know, feeding the homeless and helping the poor. And these things don't come natural. But Lord, would you start changing my heart? And then say, look, what can I do? What am I willing to do? And start with something small. And as you start, see where God leads. You say, then one day, you look in the mirror, and instead of seeing your face and forgetting who you are, you'll be surprised. 
Because as you look in the mirror, you'll see something you never thought you'd see. God having taken you to a place you never be, to become a person you never expected you could become. See, that is true freedom. Having the power to do whatever God leads you to do without having to struggle over it because you've already given him 100%. Let's look at the last verse of this chapter. The Bible tells us religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. That is true freedom, to be able to live a life of abundance where you're giving, you're sharing, you're blessing others. And guess what? You feel amazing because as you give, God gives you more. What would that look like for you? As I look at my own life, as I've served God, as I followed Him, I've never had to go into debt. Many people do. And yet, God is blessed, right? It's not that I'm more holy. In fact, I'm no more holy than the, than the worst person in this room. You know who you are, because it's all of us. We're all the worst person here in our own way. And yet God blesses us. He does things for us that we don't deserve. He changes our lives. I don't deserve God's blessing. Who could? So here's the challenge. Who wants to stand with me today and say, God, would you make me free? Would you help me to give myself fully to you so that I can live in freedom? No more living the rat race, worrying about bills, worrying about life, worrying about work worrying about stress, but Lord, take me so that I can live truly free. Is anyone willing to stand with me today as we pray for that? Amen. Bow with me as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we desire to be truly free. Lord, more than anything else, we, we live life sometimes in the meaninglessness of the day to day. We, we get so enraptured by it. Lord, we pray that you would help us to come to the place where we are living such a life of thriving and success that we would know that you have walked with us, that you have guided us, and that you have brought us to this place. We give ourselves to you, and we pray that you would continue taking us in spite of ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, please stand and join us for this last song.
Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the promise we have in you. Lord, as we go from this place, we pray that you would continue to help us to live in the light of that promise, knowing that you are coming very soon. But until then, give us perseverance, give us trust, and give us wholehearted dependence on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a couple of reminders for those who are...